Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustiger. He is the author of many books, include God Without Being, Prelegomena to Chariot and Being Given, Toward a Phenomenology of Givenness. In his lecture, titled Going Around Metaphysics, Professor Marion we address and explore the complex issue of metaphysics in religious discourse. Professor Marion, the floor is yours. I think it's better to, to stand because I'm too low. Thank you very much. Let me uh, say uh, how grateful I am to be invited to lecture in the Angelicum and uh, to be a part of this uh, great university and uh, great place in the history of uh, Catholic thought in Rome and in general. Today, I would like to give some indication about the uh, possibility, at least, to overcome metaphysics, but to avoid any uh, misunderstanding, I have to, to make clear that to overcome metaphysics is not to get rid of philosophy. In my mind, it is exactly the reverse. So it is a non-deconstructive lecture, but a constructive hypothesis. <clears throat> In fact, it is not about overcoming. It's about doubling. Doubling up, doubling down. Because philosophy did not begin as a metaphysics. But since its beginning, it has lacked its fundamental question and risked turning into metaphysics, like a wine turns sour or an argument turns bitter. Today, now that the metaphysical hypothesis of philosophy has fully developed its possibilities, once nihilism has extensively accomplished all its evaluations, we must also identify its limits. That is to say, we must face its impossibilities, which means that we must consider these impossibilities as new territories to conquer for a philosophy to come, or for whatever will start, so whatever will start philosophy up again under whatever name it may take. This means, first of all, doubling down. For it is not a matter of restarting metaphysics even on new foundations, because no, no reinitiation can eliminate, elim, eliminate what it claims to re rectify, only repeat or distort it. Nor would be a matter of dreaming up a new beginning, which, in order to avoid falling back into repetition, condemn itself to a complete indetermination of thought, as Heidegger used to say. I would be, it would be a question of riddling metaphysics by first undoing the lining that he has doubled over its philosophical overcoat in order to duplicate the pattern or model, silhouette, fashion, which the metaphysical tailor, so to speak, has dropped and adorn in it, it in. In order to double down, it must be first all done, all undone, in order to give again, or rather to give once at last, his measurements to the fabric of philosophy by unstitching the metaphysical restriction that it let itself skew. Doubling up as well as doubling down, doubling up, for we cannot escape metaphysics without first passing through it, as if imagining we could directly find its find it missing origin now unattainable. 
But by thinking against metaphysics and its restrictions, that is, in identifying its concepts and transgressing its principles, we can perhaps recover a space that is still free for philosophy. Doubling metaphysics, then, would consist in taking it as an understudy for the original actor, like a, a, a stunt double, whom it replaced for a time, but whom it cannot be substituted for. It would thus be necessary to approach the metaphysical episode of philosophy as the mask, the trace, and perhaps the vestige of the philosophy that might come. Doubling metaphysics implies also doubling around it or passing it like a sailor rounds a cape, facing it to round the bend, thus opening onto the horizon of another ocean with no apparent limits. Surpassing metaphysics and the question of being of beings would mean to pass beyond metaphysics and the privilege it confers on beings, objects, and the cogitabile, the thinkable, and even going beyond the Seinsfrage and the privilege which it concedes to the persistence of prisons as one passes through the column of Hercules or as one passes Cape Horn. But we would only be able to pass it by relying on it to move away from it, by breaking away from it like from a reef or dam. It would be a matter of detecting in, in detecting in what metaphysics says about itself what it did not say, what it did not know, what it could not or did not want to say, but doubtless suspected, if only to censor it or promptly forget it. Metaphysics could at times allow something else to be heard than what it explicitly says. It could let itself be translated, so to speak, into another language than that the one it sought it had to speak, like dubbing a foreign film in uh, French or Italian. The thinking historian of philosophy could hear, under the fixed and explicit discourse of metaphysics, another message which it hides from itself, but which could be understood as by a detective informed of what it is really all about. Little by little, the police officer in charge thus transforms his interlocutor, a target, he primes, <coughs> into a source which reveals what he himself knows, but also what is meant by what he knows, a meaning which he himself does not yet know. He is then manipulated, at any rate, double-crossed. Better still, in the course of the inquiry and interrogation, if the officer in charge knows how, the double-crossed target can unwillingly become a double agent, who not only says what he knows, but speaks against its own side, who literally contradicts it. The historian of philosophy, more precisely a non-metaphysical historian of metaphysics, could succeed in understanding from metaphysics itself what contradicts metaphysics, even to the point of making it say itself. In this way, we come to the truly double it up. We come to truly double it up. The question is thus defined as followed. How in philosophy can we think not within the limit of ordinary metaphysics, but in contradiction to them? First, this means thinking without metaphysical principles. Contradicting the limit of metaphysics might, at first glance, be understood as a matter of negation or denial, an effort not to respect the two fundamental principles of thought in metaphysical mode, that is, first the principle of identity and then the principle of sufficient reason. 
Is it possible not to respect the principle of identity, which supposes, as you know, that nothing, no thing, can differ from itself without thereby ceasing to think it rationally? To consider this possibility, it is enough to point out that this claim would be meaningless without specifying two conditions, that a thing cannot differ from itself under the same relation and at the same moment of time. But these two conditions can, in fact, never be fulfilled. First, first of all, because a thing cannot be imagined under a single relation, because what is supposed to be in itself, its usia, is secured and appears only by distinction and opposition to those attributes which happen to the usia as accidents. These chance events run along, run along with it only for a time, literally, sumbibicota, that is, uh, fellow travelers, and only by temporary coincidences defined by opposition and subtraction, and, and only their temporary coincidence defines by, by subtraction and opposition the allegedly identical relation to the thing itself. Further, the abstraction of the supposedly accidental attributes become highly problem problematic from the beginning of that distinction. First, because Aristotle distinguished the attributes that are truly contingent from other said cat auto in themselves, those being immediately distinguished by Aristotle himself into two types. Second, because, for instance, Thomas Aquinas distinguished even some subsist subsistent accident for the, <coughs> uh, the need of the Eucharistic theology, which is, in fact, a, a surprising contradiction. And finally, because from the time of Scotus and Suarez, and in fact up to Descartes and Kant, the knowledge of substantia, which no longer immediately affect us, to quote both uh, Descartes and uh, Suarez, is subjected to the mediation of its attributes. In this way, the usia ultimately disappears behind the attributes that were originally supposed to proceed, support, and render it intelligible. Usia became itself the accidental attribute of its attributes, an inattainable in itself, a thing in itself whose self no longer has the rank of a thing, except by reference to its accident, which are more essential to it than itself. The thing as usia no longer is except is except by its relation to what it is, what is not it. The distinction between substance and accident therefore proves unstable and decidedly untenable because it, result, it results in the identification of identity, the identity of Eusia, with, with what is not identical to it, the attributes, the accidental attributes. The inevitable relation of the thing with what it is not, culminate in Kant's assertion that no phenomena can be known except by comparison with another. Thus, the relation governs not only the relation of the substance to the accidents, of the cause to the effect, but against Aristotle's prohibition of uh, the prosti for the usia, but, uh, but the relation of uh, 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 the, <coughs> the, so the, 
the, the relation govern the relation of a substance to another substance. In other words, from the point of view of, of Kant, no thing has the rank of anusia because we know have, we no we can no longer have access to it under the same relation. Not only does the thing no longer appear in itself, but the phenomenon that substitutes for it never appears in or of itself, but always in relation with something other than itself. So, in this situation, with Kant, the thing differs essentially from itself. If its essence still holds it to its presence, this supposed presence is identified precisely with its distance from itself, reduced to an accident of itself. And if we still want to keep the identity of the substance to itself, by analogy referring it to the pattern of the ego, as Leibniz did, then it must confront the challenge of the distance of the ego from itself. We must no longer think of the ego as a substance in itself and identical to itself, but as a subject governed by the moment of the negative within it. It is exactly what ego stated. This is an exile from which the usia will never return in modern, philosophy, in modern metaphysics, and like the ego, it will end up in the unconsciousness of itself. And in a, it, is a, it is a fact that the unconsciousness remains the last metaphysical name of the substance. The impossibility of attaining the thing in the same respect comes from the impossibility of isolating what would remain in presence, an usia persisting in the enduring parousia. The thing is always entangled in an accidental happening which essentially affects it with a delay from itself, an expectation of the presence still and always to come and come again. Its knowledge, this noesis, must continually chase after a presence which is essentially awaited. The noema remains teleological and the thing, never ceasing to complete itself, can only be approached by continu continually revised sketches. Now, no longer a thing, but as Husserl <coughs> uh, uh, said, a field of thing, uh, 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 Dingfeld. The temporal incompleteness define the essence of the thing by the deferral of its presence, that by this difference with a A, like in Derrida, the difference from itself. The aporia of the temporality of presence, of its supposed persistence, which nevertheless is untenable in the instant, thus suspends the metaphysical validity of the principle of identity. In view of this aporia of persistent presence, <clears throat> can we not respect the principle of reason as well? I quote the principle by which, Leibniz speaking, by which, by virtue of which we consider that we find we can find no true of no true or existing fact, no true assertion without there being a sufficient reason why it is thus and not otherwise. Or are we even bound not to respect this principle since Leibniz itself concludes his definition by these remarks. Although, quote, although most of the time this reason cannot be known to us. We should never forget that the formulation of the principle of sufficient reason by Leibniz itself is always uh, uh, complemented by a restriction. 
There is always a reason why a thing, uh, an assertion, or an event must happen. But most of the time, we don't know this reason, which is known only by God. That is, to some extent, for Leibniz, very cautiously, there is a reservation to God to the full accomplishment of the principle of sufficient reason. In fact, we notice at once that the reason why any fact or utterance either happens or is verified depends on a principle which still belongs to temporality and in two ways. First, the reason of the principle may be exercised as an ontic cause or an ontic on an ontic effect. This is in classical metaphysics. <coughs> This, in classical metaphysics, implies the, the similarity, and not only the anteriority, of the cause with the effect. And therefore, again, the identity of an instantaneous presence, <coughs> here the aporia of presence in the instant, and the work of difference, difference is once again there. The principle of sufficient reason, too, is therefore burdened by the difficulty of the, the same difficulty than that of the principle of identity. Or, the re second, the reason of the principle is freed from its re if if the reason of the principle is freed from its relation to causality and expanded to a statistical causality or the observation of the same law of being, the situation is not. Uh, better. The thing of the proposition descri describing it is validated according to the regularity of the law and confirm it in return without recourse to the instant we, where cause and effect should coincide. But this second situation presupposes as well the identity of the thing or of the proposition with the law which subsumes it under its universality. So the aporia of presence in the instant and the work of difference is thus once again at work. For what exactly does this once more mean? What does we mean by this once? What instant is it? How can this once again of instance repeat itself another time while each time remain, remaining itself? How is the gap between the sufficient reason and that which makes it rational abolished by the identification on the same instant? What does that mean? That the universal, eternal law of nature could coincide with the instant of the event. How can and must this single instant nevertheless be repeated every time as a sufficient reason? Even if, as Leibniz says, very finely calculated, the gap which undermines the instant by the difference of presence with itself eats away at the principle of sufficient reason as well as the principle of identity. The obstinate attempt to re reunite the two in classical metaphysics as well as its humiliate uh, ultimate failure, alternatively confirms it. Now, the impossibility of founding either principle on the atomic simultaneity of indivisible, awayable, and instantaneous presence find its confirmation in the phenomenality and temporality of the event. For the event, take place only by suspending the principle of identity and that of sufficient reason. Let us see how. First, first of all, the event precisely take, takes place. It arises from out of itself on its own initiative and its own time. We can, of course, suspect and expect it, but not predict it. Supposing we could presume it due to the 
vigilance of intelligence or security service, services, we would know neither the time nor the precise moment in order, in, uh, no, neither the time nor the precise moment. In order not to worry about its certainty, certainly uncertain and uncertain, is certainly uncertain and uncertainly certain probability, we can ever even prefer to be ignorant of it. The fact remains that the events still rise up, rises up each time unexpected without, without warning and thus without announcing its presence. In fact, it tears open the very notion of a presence in the present, since the event defers its own presence in advance. It makes itself felt in a pure possibility, already there, but without yet being effective here and now. It differs from itself first by the future, by making itself anticipated and even sensed in the form of a menace, or more exactly, of imminence. Then, when the event actually happens, it imposes itself by raw, pure, brute fact, provoking stupor, awe, and terror. Most often, it leaves speechless those who see it. Unspeakable, it remains invisible. Peggy has explained that uh, very clearly. Because no one managed to receive it as a whole, but only by its disjointed sketches and fragments. No one can apprehend, can apprehend the event like a determined, delimited, constituable object in the order of other phenomena, which are themselves predictable and ordinarily and regularly visible only by a spectator in a dominant position of the of, in the dominant position of the objectifying subject. Its prior possibility, its eminence, is accomplished in an effectiveness immanent to itself, close in itself, imposed in itself, without any prior example, without analogy, without measure according to any scale, without awable reference. This exceptionally, exceptionality forbids recognizing whatever might be thinkable in advance and impose the event as literally unprethinkable. The formulation was coined by Schelling, un for denklisch, unprethinkable. Unprethinkable, unpredictable, even invisible, this immanence of the event exposes, exposes it as it non-identical to itself, since it remains shattered and not unified. No one knows when it began, since its eminence has made it felt before the event made itself manifest. No one estimates how far it extends, since its immanence surpasses every visible limit. No one predicts how long it will last since it suspends the flow of continuous time or even forbids it, or in any case, inaugurates a new area, a new time, like the rainbow appeared after the flood. In fact, the shattering of continuous temporality disqualifies reliance on the presence of the self-identical instant along with its very meaning. Because the event happens at first and fundamentally, without reason or cause. Without reason, for no law gathers it nor justifies it. No reason is sufficient to provide a reason, and the very fact defines it. What is proper to the event does not consist only in the fact that it defies any projection and prediction, but in fact that it assesses the insufficiency of sufficient reason to give it a good reason to happen, to happen. 
the event makes manifest the unfish, insufficient reason, the insufficiency of reason to set itself up as the last principle since the event has no hold over it, since the reason has no hold over the, the event. Without reason, in particular, without cause. Of course, we can try, and we succeed, in finding probable cause for the V event, which would then finally become an effect by calling investigators and historians, but this only after the fact of the event. But the, the, those supposed causes will only come precisely after the fact, as belated explanations of a supposed effect which has nevertheless preceded, preceded them, in fact, and even provoked them. The supposed cause become in the effect of the supposed effect. It is not in principle a question of cause, but of hermeneutic of the event. Posterior to it, probable perhaps, multiplied, no doubt, reflecting as much the presupposition of the interpreters as the origin of, if any, of the event. Thus, the event differs from itself by the path which it dispenses with a rising without assignable origin. Finally, the event, which anticipates in pre its presence and arises from unknown cause, can no longer be understood as an effect, or feigned from any cause, emancipated from sufficient reason, nothing precedes it, nothing conditions it, and it rejects the title of effect. Or more exactly, it is itself produce, it is itself that produces its effect, for its eruption into an unassignable and unconditioned presence gives rise to the effect. We must refrain from saying that it causes or produces them, those effects, in the continuity of a causal chain, since it interrupts it. We say, rather, that what follows from the event diffuses it, prolong, it prolongs it, and it can only become intelligible starting from it. The event, whose effectivity has not been preceded by any possibility, nevertheless, in its immanent effectivity, lets arise consequences without any origin than itself. Intelligible consequences deduced from a still more unintelligible fact, consequences that can be rationalized only from an absence of reason. Without being able or bound to conceive its presence, the event let us perceive in its coming its effect, which have now become intelligible. More than an effectivity seen in its effect, effects, it is, in the case of the event, a matter of an effectivity reduced to its effect, to the effect that it makes on the one who endures it and only recognizes its presence by what follows it. The event only presentifies itself in the mode of inauguration. In the end, it also differs from itself by a presence which it dispenses with, but which is nevertheless dispenses by inaugurating what he sets in motion. To think without the principle of metaphysics means also to think without the categories of metaphysics. But we can say more. For the event is not limited to itself. Of course, it constitutes the first type of saturated phenomenon, and even the foremost, prior to the idol, the flesh, and the icon, the three others. But this, its priority stems from the fact of 
eventuality, which it fully carries out, flows back, so to speak, on the other types of saturated phenomena and overdetermines them all. First, the idol, for instance. It happened to an ego as the maximum intuitive intensity that it can tolerate, but which, cannot, which it cannot foresee before experiencing it. Same way, the flesh, where the ego enjoys the privilege of affecting itself by itself, would, but it would remain anesthesied under anesthesia, yes, <coughs> if it did not discover itself always, already at work, and without any other precondition than itself alone. And finally, the invisibility of the face of the other, the icon, only becomes visible to the ego from the moment when the counter-intentionality of the gaze of the other comes upon the ego, an unforeseeable face arising of itself not made by human man, as Sergi used to say. Yet, how this eventuality manifest and why is it is characterized, characterized as foremost of all the saturated phenomena? What is proper to the event, as we have seen, what is proper to the event, as we have seen, consists in his unpredictability. It, it precedes possibility by its effectivity in contrast to the metaphysical order of modalities and dispenses it with it. It is accomplished effectively without passing through the previous stade of possibility because it, is, it escapes every concept which would allow it to be conceived in advance. Its effectivity does not know possibility because it is emancipated from, from every concept. It is freed from it because the excess of intuition overcomes the limit of every possible concept. According to eventuality, a phenomenon thus manifests itself as it gives itself. And it gives itself first of all by intuition, which at times, at times or even often, gives and is given without respect to a previous concept. According to eventuality, a phenomenon is thus manifest first of all and often without any concept or at least known yet which would precede its intuition. And therefore, it is manifest without a reason that anticipates, causes, and founds it. Eventuality thus renders sufficient reason insufficient. The insufficiency of sufficient reason obviously does not disqualify a reason in general but stigmatizes a certain sufficiency of a certain definition of this reason that is precisely too defined and too finite in a broad sense and even beyond its historical dating from Dan Scotus to Hegel, metaphysics could be characterized by a double delimitation of logos as it is taken by <coughs> a formal logic. According to Aristotle, logos consists first of all and almost exclusively in saying something about something. Tikatatinos legen. But speaking and thinking allow much more than saying something about something. It allows and even demands demands the accomplishment of the manifestation of a thing as such without trying to delimit it or define it. 
The categories on the other end define in advance the questions that we can all the questions that we can and should always impose on a thing. Thus, the characteristics that can be inputted, inputted to it as so many accusation, which is the first meaning of categoria, accusation. What persistence it can present, how can it be distinguished from other kind, specific kind of presence, what presentary and accidental presences can it claim, for instance, quantity, quality, position, chronological moment, disposition, activity, passivity, attitude, and finally, relation. These categories thus allow us to imagine in advance and by demands regulated by concept what the thing can and must be in order to find itself rightly and even legally admitted into the field of knowable beings. The list of categories left by Aristotle in what Kant would deplore as a rhapsody was nonetheless kept through the entire era of metaphysics from being declined as naturae simplicissimae by Kant, by Descartes, or a priori con as a priori concepts by Kant. Even their systematization by Hegel and their overthrow by Nietzsche have not called them into question and their list, their function, and their log logic has remained the same. In the end, the difficulty in the aporia of, of the categories, more exactly, of the categorical restriction of the logos, does not stem for, from their deduction, nor from the coherence of their list, but from their limits. Today, it is, no longer of it is no longer a question of correcting and cultivating them, with the exception, I would say, of uh, the conservative uh, tra tradition of analytical philosophy. <coughs> it is not a question of maintaining their final goal or of disqualifying them. It is a question of determining what they allow us to see and what they can only overlook. The categories remain uh, of legitimo, legitimate use, but within narrow limits, where we interpret a thing starting from the start of it, <coughs> uh, that starting from uh, where we interpret a thing, starting from the start of it that may be, that be conceived as an atom of some presence, usia, in it, in order then to regulate the relation to that which remains present only for a time and by accident. Yet, as we have, we have seen, this enterprise only proceeds by abstraction and principle, but without any real phenomenological justification. Incidentally, the principle of categorical interrogation explicitly admits its radical insufficiency since it leads us to consider what within the fullest of the things does not answer the demands of the categories, like an absurdity deaf to the requirement of logos in short, like a non-being. Therefore, whatever does not correspond to the categories and cannot be said in their language would not and could not be thought in its own way insufficient. Indeed, as it is strictly polemical and negative, sophistry has made it look fine. And it remains an open wound, wound often reawakened awakened in the history of, the, of metaphysics. How is this exclusion thematized and thus acknowledged by metaphysics? Kant established this ultimate 
limit by opposing the two supreme concepts for him, the concept of the possible and that of the impossible. The fact that he submits them to another, ultimately superior concept, that of object, does not modify anything about the essential division of possible and impossible, but actually reinforces it. For the possible and the impossible can only be opposed because, whether positively or negatively, they fall under the same condition of intelligibility, the condition of objectivity. In other words, they both fall under the a priori principle that no phenomena can be known except by yielding to the table of judgment, therefore to the pure concept of understanding, therefore to the a priori principle of experience. Objectivity is categorically operative in this way, <coughs> which is categorically operative in this way, thus decides in advance what uh, merits or inherits rationality in experience, the possible and the impossible. So the impossible remains an object, simply unthinkable or still thinkable, but as reduced to the categorical table of the four meaning of nothing. This unthinkable, therefore, this impossible, Kant has not been able to escape as the continuation of his critical trajectory has amply demonstrated and as the heritage of speculative idealism, as the heritage of speculative idealism has promptly confirmed. We do not eliminate, we do not eliminate the fiery river of impossible, just like Kant, by pointing, pinpointing its place on the map and imagining we can assign it its topographical limits. It will not run dry for so little, but demands that we at last try to channel it and cope, it, cope with it. It is a greatness of Nietzsche to have understood more than any other how to approach the impossible and take the risk doing so. Last point, the given. The impossible flows out and pulls up like a river empties into an immense lake which it crosses from one end to the other unnoticed under the usually, usually calm surface but where when it does not stir up sudden storms it works in the deeps feeding and sustaining it and so Saturated phenomena rise up and flow out, freed not from the concept, for they can end up being assigned several, but always a priori, a posteriori, inadequate and in respecting their unpredictability, but from the a priori of the concept and its objectifying imperialism. Once again, I insist on the fact that the saturation characterizes the majority of phenomena, or was amount to the same thing, that all phenomena arise from saturation in proportion of the eventuality, eventuality in, in them. The essential banality of saturation certainly suffers exceptions, but only for phenomena that we can, we can reduce to objectivity by a temporary abstraction of the, of the unconceptual in them. While technology seizures still allow us to accumulate indefinite quantity of definite objects today, but probably not for much longer, this does, this does nothing but cover up and conceal the vast flow of saturated phenomena, where we live, if less and less well, where we breathe, if more and more poorly, and where we nonetheless have our being as long as we shall be. 
end of metaphysics can be thus understood as the limitation of the power of the categories and the power of object objectification, thus triggered by the disqualification of the a priori principle of identity and of the sufficient reason. Does it then lead to the abnormality of phenomena and the anarchy of every hegemony? Such a conclusion nevertheless contradicts itself because it still presupposes that this enterprise of metaphysics has tried, accomplished, nevertheless being defeated before our eyes, the enterprise to identify the rationality of the logos with the function of principle and the foundation to the point of considering that the overthrow of principles the lifting of the prohibition against the impossible and the ruin of objectivation would, would amount to the end of the rationality of the Logos. Metaphysics pulls its last trump card in imposing us the alternative between either its version of rationality or the anarchy of the Logos. But the impossibility of the impossible implies neither the end of rationality nor the ruin of Logos. It reveals that to enter the field of the impossible, it is necessary to attain a larger rationality, the formula comes from Nietzsche, or a widened Logos, Husserl. How to cross this limit? An imprecise, undefined, and almost invisible frontier, both unsurmountable and walled off. We must rely to what we can neither doubt nor not see, the given. The given, in the last instance, attests the last instance. Before every experience, because it makes, makes it possible, before any utterance, because it provokes it, before every decision, because it can only respond to it, the given is already given. Of course, it is necessary to read the given as such, which does not, be, does not be confused, which is not to be confused with a role given that no matter, by definition indistinct, could ever give. Neither with the allegedly immediate given of consciousness, because in such a case, it is in fact, it is, in, it is always in fact the immediacy of empiricist abstraction. And because the so-called consciousness is never itself directly reached. Nor from historical fact of history, which only retrospective atten attended managers to roughly reconstitute it. Nor has it been said that an object, that the categorical mechanism restricts a priori to order and measure. And what does attain, attain the given, mean here anyway, if not perhaps the Tiganen of Aristotle? The irreducibility of the given is only attained, if it is ever attained, by the, its reduction to givenness. We have seen that give, givenness serves as the only economy of sufficient reason by giving to the point, point of bracketing the giver the only economy of the identity by giving to the point of suspending reciprocity by the recipient. Finally, the only economy of objectivity by cancelling out ever the presence of the gift which is given. Gift reduced to givenness by accepting itself from the requirement and the condition of the metaphysical manifestation of beings, more exactly, of the manifestation of things as beings and a fortiori as objects. Before and without persistent presence, it gives. And it gives even without any it, except, as Heidegger said, written large, it has written large. In S. Gibbs, S should be written large. What does written large mean? 
to not consider the S, the it, as the cause or the condition, as a prior requirement or presupposition of givenness, but to apprehend it as the very process of this givenness, of its arising from itself alone. It gives, it gives, givenness arrives, there is nothing other than it, the it itself. The obstacle to receiving givenness, the one which makes us all back with our all strengths and especially with our all weakness now appear clearly. How can we explain our remaining fascination with metaphysics, which makes us vindicate the title even when the history of philosophy has long established its origins and limits, to the point that many of the very people who claim to pursue it have in fact refused to take up its concept and aporias. It is from nostalgia, is it from nostalgia, obstinance, ignorance? No doubt it is time to time the case, but there is also something deeper. Metaphysics, even more as a negative philosophy, as Schelling used to call it, is constituted as a science of the a priori. And in this way, it comes to, man, to an end. Yes, this a priori institutes the ego as a ground, raising it to the rank of the last transcendental demiurge. But passing beyond metaphysics implies thus that the ego gave up, give up, gives up its transcendental status from the principle of principle in favor of givenness, as Husserl explained. In other words, that the ego renounced the function of universal evaluator of all things that have become only its values. In short, that the ego shed the proud name Kant, as Kant said, conferred to it by its role on the stage of metaphysics in order to assume the name of the a posteriori witness of the given. And it is this ego, this non-metaphysical ego, this a posteriori witness of the given that could become, hopefully, the new uh, ground for a theoretical approach to the given, that is, to revelation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Marion, thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. And now we have a time uh, for questions. So please use the microphones. Thank you very much. Sit down. Uh, I would ask, uh, why did you choose as first principles of metaphysics the principle of identity and the principle of sufficient reason um, as such? Of, of course, it was only one lecture, so you didn't have time to explain everything. But um, as a metaphysician by formation, I know that there are many, po many some other, not many, but some other possible choices. Uh, for example, principle of, of non-contradiction and a uh, principle of causality, like even maybe Gilles Son would argue, and not to quote an author you, you often quote in your works. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have chosen those uh, two uh, formulations of the principle. First, because uh, they were coined by Leibniz, uh, and Leibniz uh, uh, consider the principle of non-contradiction reducible to the principle of identity, and I agree with to that. And uh, uh, the principle of causality can be reduced uh, to the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, so uh, I stick to Leibniz, 
because to my knowledge, Leibniz is the best, uh, uh, the best uh, witness of the system of metaphysics. So you could uh, start with uh, Suarez and go up to Egol and you will find those two uh, principles as well. And I, I don't see uh, what difference it may be if we would have privileged the principle of non-contradiction and the principle of, co of causality, which are too narrow to be first principles. Thank you, Doctor. I was a little bit confused. Uh, I didn't understand when you referred to the event. Were you referring to one event among many, all of which are self-causing or, or principles within themselves, or, or one supreme event that no, is the uh, cause of other things? Because I'm, I'm trying to fit into the category of an uncaused cause or, or first uh, uh, prime uh, movers. Uh, I, I don't have that, that grasp, but when you refer to the event, what what are you referring to? First, if you uh, consider as uh, uh, Kant, Hegel did, and this was uh, pointed out as a critic by Nietzsche, uh, that uh, everything we know uh, is an object that is as an uh, adequate explanation through a concept or a definition using several concepts articulated between them. In that case, there is something which we cannot know. It is either the individual or the rule of, uh, of medieval thought, you cannot define the individual, and the event. The individual is so individual that no universal determination can uh, get to reach it. And the event, because uh, the event cannot be reproduced, cannot be produced, and comes, that's the paradox, uh, cannot be repeated, and comes without being preceded by its possibility. And the possibility in uh, classical metaphysics, in, in Kant, in Hegel, in, uh, in Leibniz, in, uh, in Suarez, indeed, and I guess in, uh, in Lanscotus as well, the, the possibility is the fact that we can have the concept of the thing that is his definition, the definition of his essence, previously to the effectivity of the thing. And how can we know that it is possible and not impossible? Because there is no contradiction in our concept. The possible is what is not contradictory when we conceive it in our understanding. The event has this very strange feature that we have no idea before it comes. By definition, we are surprised. Even if it, it may be felt as imminent, it is uh, unexpected. And when its his effectivity breaks out, the effectivity is accomplished. And nevertheless, we have no idea of its essence of his meaning, of his non, of his possibility, and of his cause. That is to say, September 11 or World War I have no cause, no possibility. Indeed, there is a lot of good reasons which can be uh, reconstituted uh, in the aftermath of it. We can, and the historian do that, we can uh, find out many factors, uh, trends, forces, 
which can contribute to have made possible this uh, first war, World War, or uh, September 11. But those causes, if any, are more explanations which come after the fact. So, to some extent, those causes, in the case of the event, don't, don't come before the actuality, the effectivity, as causes and possibilities. They come after the effectivity, and they are more the effect. The causes are the effect of the, 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 the event itself. That's the strange thing. And if there is something which cannot be constituted as an object according to the laws of classical metaphysics, it is, for instance, the individual and the, uh, uh, and the uh, event, any event. So I referred at the very end, the last line, to the uh, event and the given of revelation for Christians. But there is a lot of other even, events. They all share this characteristic. Apax, F apax, as it is said in uh, an episode of Yibu, in an episode of Peter, and uh, somewhere else. Apax. And this F apax uh, remains out of the grasp of the classical metaphysical approach. This is my point. Thank you. There are many classical systems of metaphysics and very different. Uh, and in some systems of uh, classical metaphysics, there is a great importance given to apophatism. Don't you think that apophatism is a sort of uh, consciousness awareness of the limits of metaphysics inside the metaphysics, which uh, does not imply an, an overcoming of metaphysics, but a, a sense, a metaphysical, metaphysical sense of the limits of metaphysics. Well, I completely agree with you that uh, any kind of, of uh, apophatism is uh, the, the, the a way to overcome metaphysics or to resist metaphysics. And uh, uh, from the beginning in Christian thought, biblical thought, it was always the, the, the argument. Uh, the ways of God are not the ways of man. So uh, any limitation you may uh, impose to God as uh, the creator, as, uh, which cannot be really understood uh, in uh, philosophy, as uh, 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 redemptor, as resurrected and so on, every kind of uh, 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 impossible, uh, you can resist that. Uh, credo quia impossibility. Non quia absurdum. May I insist? I've seen that too, too often. Tertullian has never written credo quia absurdum. In De Carne Christi 5.2, he says credo quia impossibile which is far better. Because that means that the impossibile is the impossibile for God, uh, for us, not for God. So, credo, quia impossibile, for us, is not impossible for God. This is exactly, I think, your point. So, the, it is clear that uh, uh, any uh, philosophical denial of 
the exception to the rules, including the rules of metaphysics, in the case of God, should be uh, rejected in the name and with the aid of any kind of apophatism. The point I would perhaps disagree with you is that there is any kind of apophatism in metaphysics, strictly speaking. If you consider that metaphysics uh, start with, technically, starts with uh, the questioness metaphysicalis of Dan Scott, which is the first great work uh, using the, 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 the word, uh, with uh, the Disputationes Metaphysicae up to Hegel, uh, there is no, uh, no emphasis on apophasis. As uh, uh, Dan Scotus used to say, uh, uh, I love more affirmations. <laughs> and uh, indeed, uh, up to uh, ego, the concept is affirmative. So uh, the moment when the philosopher uh, referred positively uh, to something which could be uh, compared to the theological apophasis, would be in modernity, uh, philosopher like Nietzsche, like Kierkegaard, uh, and to some extent to Sarah Heidegger, where there is a place for the silence, for silence in, in, philosophy, in philosophy. But the classical philosophy, uh, I, I was first trained as an historian of classical philosophy, uh, the end of uh, medieval ages up to uh, German idealism, with the exception of the last Schelling, which I quote, who called uh, metaphysics stricto sensu as negative philosophy, uh, uh, all of them were uh, uh, non-apophatic. When, when Schelling says in the, uh, in the uh, lesson uh, published under the, the title of uh, Philosophy of Revelation, <coughs> that uh, Hegel as uh, the final uh, in heritage of uh, classical metaph metaphysics is negative philosophy. This is the first time that the, uh, the classical metaphysics was, was termed negative. And uh, uh, what he called positive philosophy is precisely uh, the philosophy starting with a factum with a given, the unthinkable in advance, unfordenklich. And what is this philosophy? It is the philosophy of Schilling, because it's starting from the factum of uh, Christian revelation. Christian revelation is a given. And from that given on, we have to adapt the philosophy to it, to it and not adapt the given to metaphysics. And so, so this is the turning point. It's why, why I think that uh, the Schelling is, is fascinating because he, is, he was a part of the flourishing German idealism, the first flourishing, and he was the first to see the end of German idealism as the end of metaphysics. It's why, he, so I, say, I said Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, but I, I should have said first the last Schelling. Thank you very much. Well, I'm uh, in the Faculty of Social Sciences here, and often when I hear lectures by philosophers, I feel like I'm walking into some kind of discussion that's going on between people, and I've only heard part of the discussion, and so it's difficult sometimes to connect with all the things that are going on, which I'm sure are very deep and important. On the other, on the other hand, I think since anybody who knows anything about history of social sciences knows they're all born out of the side of philosophy. Um, the, these, these philosophical discussions are very, very important for us. And if I think about the area that I work in mostly, which is economics, 
Um, we could sometimes say that economics is a very metaphysical subject in many ways. It has all kinds of assumptions about the way the world should be. It's trying to show how cause and effect follow. It's trying to guide politicians about what decisions they should be making and all kinds of things like this. And of course we see how many mistakes are made. Uh, the financial crisis was only the most obvious recent example about economic theories not working and producing uh, in some ways the opposite results of what they were supposed to produce. So I think this question about uh, doubts about causality and, and this sort of question is, is shown by these sorts of modern sciences which are uh, somehow carrying forward philosoph philosophy but in a, in a different sense. Um, my question really is um, about, uh, well, I've got two questions, I think. First of all, um, I think um, uh, you said at the beginning that you were looking at the possibility of overcoming metaphysics not in a deconstructive way, but in a constructive hypothesis. And you, you said this in many different ways about what you, you were trying to do. It would be very interesting for me, as someone who's trying to think about how we should rethink the foundations of economics, what could be this sort of constructive basis that you're, you're talking about? Because, as I say, I'm dealing with a subject that, that doesn't really think in terms of metaphysics, but actually tries to do something quite similar to, to what, what you're, you are talking about there. The other thing, in a way, is following on a bit from what Father Bonina was just saying there, if there are these different approaches to metaphysics, are there some sources within this biodiversity of different metaphysical approaches, we might say, that are more useful at this juncture in history, or that could help us perhaps to deal with some of these aporia mm -hmm. um, that are already quite well developed, but are not the mainstream, not the, the, the German idealistic stream that you're talking about, or, or some of them. Well, Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm not an economist, not answer your questions. Uh, I can only uh, make some few remarks. The first, you are completely right. Uh, economy is deeply uh, framed by uh, philosophical presuppositions. And I would even say modern metaphysical presuppositions. Why? Because uh, when economy started to become uh, if not a science, at least uh, uh, an uh, organized discourse, uh, it was based on the idea that there is laws, universal laws in economy, which, are, which duplicate some laws in physics. And it was why... Uh, uh, the, the economy was based on the idea that there is always an exchange, that uh, ideal and rational economy should be always at the end of fair exchange. Uh, so the wealth of nations is that uh, you can trade uh, different uh, goods, kind of goods, at the end there is a, a fair trade, a fair exchange. So that was the, the rule. Uh, uh, as in physics, there is an equilibrium of the force, and this is the uh, standby. And, uh, so the idea was to import into uh, human production, human intercourse, and human action the standards of uh, nature physical nature and mathematics. This is very clear in Locke, in all the, those guys. And uh, I think that you can um, uh, create and make rational a certain level of economy, which is uh, uh, the economy uh, up to Marx, or to perhaps to, to Keynes. <clears throat> that is the idea that <clears throat> we should try to make the economy a fair trade. So uh, there are different tactics. Uh, uh, 
accumulation of, uh, of, uh, of the industry, uh, uh, monopoly, uh, international exchange, uh, uh, syndic syndicates of workers uh, 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 to lift up the, the wages, uh, revolution, <laughs> the intervention of the state, many, many reasons. But in any case, there is supposedly the assumption that uh, the equality and the trade are the model to the point that uh, there is no, there is always an economy of the exchange. So far, so good. But uh, there is something which completely overlooked Perhaps not today. I'm not uh, uh, competent enough to, 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 to say that. There is other way of dealing with uh, poverty and uh, wealth which, is, which are not based on the fair exchange, but on, that is, on the, the economy of the exchange of about reciprocity. It is a gift. So there is the so-called economy of the gift, which is not a very good word, because if there is a gift, uh, there is no economy, because there is no exchange and there is uh, no uh, fair trade. The economy of gratuity, the gratuity, the gift, are another way, another level to understand what we call economy in general a non-economical way to understand economy, which, uh, which refers to uh, other behaviors. The more you give, so the poorer you are, uh, the better it is for you. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the logic of the gospel, and which is not inefficient, which is very efficient for the reverse and perhaps more efficient in emergency cases than the first uh, analysis of the economy. So you see that uh, the, the paradox today of the economist is that in some cases of crisis, of some uh, peripheral uh, uh, issues, to have a good economy means to give up the standards of the regular uh, exchange economy and to shift from the exchange to the logic of the gift. So it, is a, it is really a challenge. It is, it, is, it is not an economical challenge. It is an intellectual challenge and much more difficult to face, indeed. That's the only thing I can say. So we have a chance for last questions. Do we have? Thank you so much. Um, is your study of givenness somehow uh, akin to uh, Merleau-Ponty's analysis of perception? Of? Perception. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I've tried to, to make uh, uh, some uh, to pay some attention to the uh, to the givenness in uh, being given and in the erotic phenomenon, uh, but uh, Merleau-Ponty is uh, of no help. Yes. Uh, what? A, yeah. Sorry. Uh, for that. For that. Yes. My question is about. Um, the finding of something which transcends our knowledge, but is always, it's always been there. I don't know. How do we come in contact with the nation, with givenness? I, I'm trying to understand what, what, you, what, what you're trying to explain to us when you talk about givenness. Well, givenness is a... Is a, is a most central concept, uh, difficult to s sum up because uh, uh, 
it comes from different uh, uh, horizons. Uh, you have the, the, the question of the gift, uh, which was framed to some extent by Marcel Mauss in the essay on the gift. But for, for Marcel Mauss, uh, who was an ethnologist and sociologist, uh, the gift is always an exchange. So you have to criticize that to explain that the real gift is not a gift followed by a counter gift reciprocal, but the real gift is given for nothing. So you have this analysis of the gift. Uh, you have another analysis of the, of the given uh, in uh, classical philosophy. Uh, the data of the same data in uh, English empiricism or the data of consciousness in Bergson, uh, which is a, a good starting point with, uh, with uh, something wrong. That is uh, the illusion that the, the given, given to consciousness, state of, state of consciousness or uh, sun data, are immediate, which is not the case. We have no immediate sun datum of uh, color, of, uh, of uh, sound, and so on. Uh, every sound we hear, even immediate, is immediately reconstruct with a signification. When we hear this sound, we know this is police or uh, an ambulance. And it is not a sound, it is a, it is a car in the street. So there is no pure sound, only in laboratories, acoustic laboratories, there are pure sounds to some extent, but this pure sound is constructed. So uh, the immediacy of the given is itself a, a problem. So the given is also, in phenomenology, the starting point of the phenomenon. Uh, the principle of, of principle by Husserl, that everything which is uh, given in the intuition is to be received as such. So you have a, a, so the given is, how do you say that? The core of the atom. Yeah. And there are many, so I tried to unify them. And indeed, there is a, a, a theoretical meaning of the given. Dona gratis data, grace, and so on, that is the given. So it is this university and pluriversity of the given which is central. So the given is much more encompassing, for instance, than being. Because uh, the, the given and the gift are still working when the concept if any, of being, can't. You can give nothing. When you give your attention, when you give your life, when you give your love, you give nothing. But it is, you give more when you give your love, your time, your attention, your care, than when you give some money, and even a lot of money. It is easier in some situation to give a lot of money in order to be allowed not to give your life, your time, your attention, your love. <laughs> so <laughs> there are cases where it is more difficult to give no thing than to give something. So this is the reason why I think the question of the gift, the given, the grace is absolutely central today. For philosophers and for theologians as well. Professor Marion, thank you very much once again. Thank you to all of you here in Angelicum and all of you in front of your screens. 
And uh, the next public GP2 lectures will be held here at the Angelicum on Wednesday, November 29th, at the same time, half past four. Professor George Weigel will present a talk entitled John Paul II, The Priority of Culture and the Contemporary Culture Wars. We cordially invite you to join us on the day. Thank you very much.